Well, hello, and how is everybody today? Welcome to the Seth Joyner Show. It's good to be back with you guys another week. Hey, listen, we're talking to him today. We're just talking birds, talking football, talking whatever it is that you guys want to talk. So um, you guys throw the questions at me. As you can tell, I'm outdoors um, at my man's Big Scott's house over in Camden, New Jersey. I'm back east. I had a heck of a heck of a Father's Day. By the way, happy Father's Day, belated Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I'm talking to real fathers, the ones that's there, the ones that's involved, the ones that are mentoring, the ones that are making a difference in their children's lives. Happy belated Father's Day to you all. I got the greatest um, Father's Day gift uh, this this past Sunday. Um you know, my good buddy Scott asked me to come by his house and, you know, we were just hanging out, you know, celebrating Juneteenth um, the day before. And, you know, he said, come out of the house. I'm like, man, for what? He's like, I got a surprise for you. So I get here uh, and we're chopping it up. And all of a sudden he asked me, he says, hey, man, look in the front seat and, and, and grab, you know, that bag I got in the front seat. And I go to the front seat and I look inside and my son is in the front seat. He flew all the way from Arizona, um, leave it to my girl, Kendra, and my one of my best friends, Scott Shepard, to put on the surprise of the Father's Day weekend. To say the less, hey, um, my heart was full. The only thing I was missing was having my daughter with me on Father's Day uh, to complete the deal. But what a surprise. I hope you guys out there had a great Father's Day as well. Um, Hey, listen, I told you guys um, last week that, um, you know, I, I, I had an announcement, a major announcement for you guys. Um, and I, I wanted to be the first to let you guys know um, before um, you begin to hear the news begin to drip out. But um, um, I will not be returning to NBC Sports Philadelphia to do the pre and post game show this upcoming season, um, you know, Sometimes things run their course and it's time, you know, um, my man, Ray Diddy called it a career and, um, you know, it's, it's hard to replicate and duplicate, um, the kind of chemistry and camaraderie that we had, um, you know, somebody, you know, some of you guys are already like, what, what don't listen, don't worry. Um, information will flow in the next couple of weeks. It's not like, you know, you're not going to be able to hear my comment commentary. Um, you know, a, a, another situation arose and created an opportunity for me, you know, to do something different, to do something new. I've been at, um, at Comcast for five, six years. And sometimes, you know, quite honestly, things just kind of run their course and it was time. Um, but don't get me wrong. I'm not going anywhere. Um, and I'm going to let you guys who really want to hear my commentary, want to hear uh, my post-game remarks, you're going to know exactly where to go um, to get it. So stay tuned. In the next couple of weeks, there'll be not only a press conference, um, but I'll be, you know, posting on social media. You'll begin to see some things, you know, to crop up um, around the city as far as billboards and things of that nature. You'll know exactly where to find me in my, in my commentary post-game after every game um as far as the eagles are concerned okay um i just want to let you guys know as a matter of fact th this is the first posting and this is the first um you guys are some of the first people you know on the outside on the peripheral um that actually know you know what's what's going on um so some of you guys you know i, I see the comments you know um, some people are shocked some people are surprised some people say we'll miss you, um, a plethora of different things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think that, you know, sometimes it's time, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Listen, you guys are going to have um, an opportunity to hear me to continue, continue doing what I'm doing. Um, I love football. I love talking Eagles. I love to analyze the game. Um, I love to break it down not only for you guys, but the Philly fans. Um, so I'm going to be here. My content will be here. Um, the Seth Jordan Show 
isn't going anywhere. It'll be here. Um, I got some some surprises as far as that's concerned um, coming up as well. Listen, there's a lot of good stuff that's going on. Um, so don't feel bad about me moving on. Um, just know that, um, that I'm, I'll be here. Um, you just may have to go to a different platform to find me, but I'll be here doing what I've been doing for the last five or six years post-game um, for the Eagles. Uh, that's the big announcement. Um, one thing I want to share with you guys, and I would love to get your take on it, the Eagles this week came up with a new word mark. How do you guys feel about that? I know you've seen it. Um, there was a lot of banter and a lot of conversation that went on um, on social media about the change. Um, and I'm just really curious to see how you guys feel about it. Um, it's not as it's not as fluid and it's not as bold as the last one, but it's clean. Um, and I, I, it, you know what? I can't wait. I can't wait to see the um the Kelly Green uniforms with the Eagle word mark across the chest because you know they're coming with that. You know they're coming with that when it comes. Um, and I see the comments. Some of you guys don't like it um, and whatnot. But, you know, things continue to move on. Um, things change. That's just life. It's the way that it is. You know, they are, you know, the Eagles are always – and the NFL, for that matter, they're always marketing what they do. Um, and somebody in the, in the marketing department, you know, came up with this idea and they felt like, you know, this is what we should do. And this is what would look better. This is a nice new change. Um, so they're going with it. So we'll see. We'll see how it continues to plan out. We'll see how it looks on all the memorabilia, the new memorabilia that comes out here in the 2022 season. Hey, before I move on, I just want you guys to, you know, continue to, um, you know, shoot your questions to me. Um, it's just me and you today. And, and we, we're going to roll like that, you know, until right before the season rolls around. Because um, I like the interaction. When I have an opportunity to just hang out with you guys, you know, answer some of your questions, um, talk about some of the things that you want to talk about, um, that's a lot of fun. But with some of the some of the changes that are coming, um, we might not be able to do it that way during the season. So I'm going to hang with you guys as much as I can, um, you know, before the season actually starts. Um, so let me see. What else? What else do we have? Um, you know, you got. Oh, I know what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the and I want to I want to know what you guys think. The Eagles finished up their. OTAs early, um, earlier than any other team in the NFL. Um, and from what I understand, from what I understood, you know, in the, in the, the reasoning for it from Nick Sirianni and the Eagles organization was that they wanted to, you know, kind of save the players legs. They wanted to get them fresh, make sure they're fresh and make sure that, you know, um, you know, they go into the season with fresh legs. And when I heard that, you know, I, I you know, Ron Jaworski's golf tournament was last week. So I had an opportunity, you know, to chop it up with, you know, some of the old heads. Um, I mean, guys that go way, way back and talk with Harold Carmichael, talk with Wilbert Montgomery, you know, Mike Quick was there, you know, they were honoring, you know, Dick Vermeil at this event. Um, you know, some of the younger guys like Ike Reese, and and um, and Jason Avant, um, you know, a lot of these guys were there, and I just wanted to know, um, you know, what they thought about this move by the Eagles to kind of preserve the players and minimize the amount of work that they're actually getting, you know, in in uh, during their OTAs. Um, it kind of caught me aback a little bit because, you know, Jalen Hurts and these wide receivers, they're going to get together you know, somewhere when they leave the building, they're going to be throwing passes. They're going to be doing everything that they do during OTAs, you know, away from the coaching staff. Um, the, the the time that the coaches actually have with the players, you know, to really interface with them, work on technique and watch film and all, is so minimal in comparison, you know, to when, when I was playing. 
Um, we were always around. You were always with, you know, your coaches. You were always with, you know, each other. And, you know, what you what, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to create that camaraderie where guys are together as much as you can get them together. Um, plus, the greatest time for um, young guys to, like, grow up, the greatest time for um, coaches to be able to put their handprint, their fingerprint, the blueprint on their players is in the off season. Um, so I'm not sure I really, I, I really understand this. Listen, you know, we live in an age where these guys don't do a whole lot of anything anyway. You know, you've got, um, you, you pretty much have, um, you know, limited days of hitting. Um, you've got limited days um, of, of contact. Um, you know, whether you're talking about, the off season or whether you're talking about OTAs or whether you're even talking about training camp, even training camp is limited. I mean, you've seen a couple of teams, the Cowboys and, and the Baltimore Ravens um, have gotten fined during this off season for, you know, excessive, um, you know, contact during the off season. I think these coaches realize that their players need it and not that I'm talking about hitting. I'm not talking about full pads and hitting, but in order to play an aggressive game, in my opinion, you have to practice it aggressively. You know, you cannot, in my opinion, um, you know, try to safeguard yourself against injuries. Injuries are going to happen. You're going to have injuries that happen during the game. You're going to have injuries that happen in practice. And then you're going to have those freak injuries that just happen during the offseason. That's just a part of it. You know, you're never going to be able to protect these guys in such a violent, fast in tough game, you're not going to be able to protect them. You can't put them in bubble wrap and try to get them to week one. That's the problem that I have, you know, during the preseason. How can you get continuity? How can you get guys on the same page? How do you get rhythm, you know, when you sit your entire starting units in all phases and, and don't allow them to play, you know, at least a half of football at some point during the preseason? Then you roll into the regular season – and the intensity goes up 20, 25%. And these guys aren't used to even practicing because you can never simulate, can never simulate um, the speed, um, the force, the power um, that you experience during a game and practice. It's literally impossible to do that. So you got to try to get as close to it as you possibly can during practice time. And, I get it. You know, the, these players during the collective bargain agreement, they made sure that they were taken care of from the standpoint that the coaches couldn't overwork them. But there's a fine line between overworking players and not working players enough. And most of the time when you see adjustments being made, these adjustments are being made based upon overreaction. It's overreaction. I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, what you've seen in the adjustments from the physical nature of the game, you know, I get it. Seven hundred and sixty million dollar lawsuit that you lose to the players because of concussions. Um, but when you make that adjustment that they made, where if you seem like you breathe on a guy now, it's a fifteen yard penalty and a fine. That's an overreaction because the game is too, it's too fast, too aggressive, and it's too violent for you to try to police that out of the game. And players understand. Players know. Um, you know, I may be mortgaging my future health. I may be putting myself in danger as far as the future is concerned, but that's an occupational hazard. It comes along with it. There's not a single player that plays in the NFL that does not know that he's going to get hurt. He's going to walk away with some, some bumps and some bruises, and he's probably going to have multiple surgeries before his career is over. Okay. But that's the trade off. You trade that off for, the financial stability that you get to become a champion and all of those types of things. That's how it works. Um, but the NFL in their, in their wisdom of trying to um, keep players healthy, I think they've made them more susceptible to injuries um, because when players don't pra practice hard and you put them in um, tight situations, that's where the injuries happen. When you're used to going half speed, and you never, ever go full speed, you know, in, in, in practice. Now you get in the games, you don't have any other choice but to go full speed. Somebody's trying to take your head off, you know. So if you don't practice that at a level where you can get as close to that as you can possibly get, 
um, it's really, really difficult to keep guys healthy. Um, I, I just know that, you know, training camp for me galvanized my body. All the bumps and bruises that I received during training camp, all of a sudden they were calcified once the season started. And once I started getting hit in those different areas, um, you know, my body wasn't injured because my body was already calcified towards that. Um, so let's let's jump into some questions. I've been looking at some interesting things. I'm going to I'm going to roll back, but I'm also going to um, look at some of the questions, you know, that are current. Birdman um, says, um, you know, Shane Steichen says Hurts takes no days off. OTAs are not. Jalen is putting in the work. Hey, listen, I have no problem with that. But there still is something to be said for, you know, you being able to keep your players together, for those guys to be working under a script that the coaching staff puts together, for them to find the camaraderie that they need. Um, now, I don't know, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you know, the coaches are, are putting together a uh, a script for the quarterback and the wide receivers to work. But understand the camaraderie that you get, the cohesiveness that you create when you have all five starting offensive linemen, your starting tight end, all your starting wide receivers, and your starting running backs and your quarterback all in one place working on – on everything at one time um it's just it's priceless it's priceless and the great teams that you know and, and i'm not saying that you know the eagles don't inspire to, to be champions you know I, I think every single team that basically takes the field all 30 32 teams believe that they're going to be the super bowl champion come 2023 february 2023 but the truth of the matter is there's only a handful of teams that are actually doing the work, that are putting in enough work, um, the, the proper work, to be able to be competitive as they need to be, okay? I saw this story earlier in the week. Um, where did it go? Did I scroll past it? I saw this this story earlier in the week. There was a, um, a article and some conversation about um, – um, with regards to the running back, I'm trying to scroll back and find it here. Um, you guys bear with me for a second. Um, yeah, we're talking about a trade sending Andre Dillard to um, – um, I can't find it, so I'm not going to be able to give um, the person who who posted it the credit for it, but – a trade sending Andre Dillard to the Cleveland Browns for running back Kareem Hunt. And I got a little excited when I saw that. Um, the probability of it happening is pretty pretty darn slim, you know, I would think. But um, there we go. Jeremiah Pitts threw it up there. Running back Hunt from Browns. Um, listen, I loved Kareem Hunt, you know, when he went through his little ordeal. Um, we just knew that this young kid was going to get a second chance. Um, and I can remember, you know, I made the comment. I said, hey, the Eagles should sign him, okay, or at least claim him so you got his rights. Um, because when he gets right, he can be an asset. And I get what he did. I, trust me, I'm not saying that you, you know, you just forget about the trouble that he got himself into. I'm not saying that you forget about, you know, what he did. But the truth of the matter is, and this is where we are, you know, in professional sports. Um, there's a small percentage of the players or people in this world, for that matter, that possess the skill set to play at the professional level. So when you have a, a player who gets himself in trouble and people get bent out of shape about the fact that he gets a second and a third opportunity. Um, listen, it's going to, it's just going to be that way because if that player can play, then there's a need for him. If there's a need for him, then some team somewhere is going to make a play for him. And I just felt like Kareem Hunt was a guy that they could have just, you know, they could have claimed him off waivers. They could have helped him through his situation. Um, 
they would have had him at the at the bottom of the barrel because when he came off his suspension and he was eligible, you could have just offered him because you had his rights. You could have just offered him, you know, um, the minimum salary. And this kid was in in line before he got himself in, you know, in the situation he got himself into. He was in line for a major payday. Um, so now he's got to start all over and, and, and rehabilitate, you know, his career. And I think we've seen enough of Kareem Hunt to know that he's one of the premier running backs in the NFL. But at the end of the day, Cleveland Browns can only pay one top tier guy. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, you go and you get Kareem Hunt and you move Miles Sanders out of the way. But competition brings out the best in everybody. If Miles really wants to be Miles Sanders, rather, if he really, really wants to be the guy, then guess what? You got to show up. You got to be healthy. You got to do everything you can to prove to this Eagles organization that you can be the dude. And if you can, all the better. Because if you got a guy like Kareem Hunt, now you got competition. And I think the competition brings out the best in everybody. It brings out the best for your football team. Okay? Um, let's see. Um, I'm not sure what this was in reaction to. Um, but Philly Eagle 56 said, just don't abandon the run and we should win 85% of the games. Okay. This, this, this is a, an interesting thought because this is my take on it. My take is if the Eagles are going to try to find out whether Jalen hurts is the guy. Okay. You can't, you can't be a run dominant team this year. And I know some of y'all are like, what? What did Seth just say? Mr. Oh, you got to run the football. I'm telling you right now. Okay. If you're going to be successful in the NFL, there's nothing wrong with balance, but Jalen Hurts this year is going to have to throw the ball 30 to 35 times a game in order for the Eagles to, at the end of the season to feel like they know whether or not he's the guy you can't go through another season like last year where, you know, you run the ball, you know, 60, 40, 60, 60% run and 40% pass. You know, listen, Howie Roseman didn't go and make all these trades and bring in all these assets on the offensive side of the ball for us to run it. I get that. You know, what, what gets me all bent out of shape is when the Eagles get to a place sometime in their play calling where it's just pass, 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 pass. Now you make it easy for defenses to try to figure you out. You make it easy you know, for defenses to take advantage via the blitz of what you're trying to do. But when you're running the ball and you've got some kind of balance, um, now it's a different set of circumstances. But I think the only way that the Eagles are going to be able to prove to themselves as an organization whether Jalen Hurts can be the guy or not, listen, he's going to have to put that ball in the air 30 to 35 times per game this year in order for them to feel like He's the guy moving forward. And two years later, you know, we're going to sign him to a franchise deal if that's what it takes. Um, but uh, I, I get your point about the run. And I think it's more important for a rookie quarterback, these young quarterbacks that are just learning coverages and learning disguises and learning the multiple blitzes that they've probably never seen before. It's important for you to protect them via the run. But if you're a Super Bowl aspiring football team, listen, that quarterback's going to have to throw the ball. You can be balanced. I'm not saying that you got to be 70% pass and 30% run. There's nothing wrong with being 65-35, 60-40 pass to run or 60 or, or you know somewhere in there, 50-50, if you will. Um, if you can run the ball effectively, that will open up your passing game. If you pass the ball effectively, that will open up your running game. If you can do both with great balance, now you've got offenses off kilter and you can, you know, your play action pass comes in, your 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 read option, your, um, you know, all of that stuff, you know, is up when you're balanced that way. But I've seen plenty of times where the Eagles get in trouble, you know, where they become pass heavy and pass heavy for a quarterback who's still trying to learn is a detriment to his development. Um, I believe that Jalen Hurts will take the next step this year, um, and we shall see. But he's, but like I said, he's going to have to put that ball in the air 30 to 35 times this year if the Eagles are going to be, um, you know, successful from an offensive um, point of view. All right, let's see what else we got working here. Um, let me go back to the top. 
Um, I, I agree with you, Mad Hatter. Um, Hurts was built for Philly. Um, I haven't seen a, a quarterback, you know, that I could say that about in a long time. You know, if you guys remember, Donovan McNabb got off, you know, to um, a bumpy start as far as his relationship, you know, with um, with the city of Philadelphia. Um, but Jalen, man, I'm telling you, he just he just got some things about him that you just really got to like. You know, he doesn't get rattled. I'd like to see him, you know, take a step this year as far as how he communicates with the media. He communicates with us about what happens on the football field, learning how to talk about things without giving away things. Um, he's pretty vanilla and, and pretty blah when, you know, in his press conferences. I'd like to see him step up, grow up a little bit, you know, and, and, and be more engaging um, at the podium. But um, other than that, man, you, you got to love. He doesn't get he doesn't get rattled. He's not bothered, you know, by the criticisms, um, because I think he's the type of guy that will criticize himself before everybody else even gets a chance to criticize. him. You know, that to me is what's evident about a guy who's going to get better is a guy that wants to get better, a guy who's accountable. It's nobody else's fault when Jalen Hurts plays bad, but his, but his own. And he owns it. He steps up to the mic and he owns it. He doesn't point the finger at somebody else. He doesn't come up with excuses about play calling. He doesn't come up with excuses about how the ball slipped out of his hands or so on and so forth. He owns it. Okay. All right, Tom. Let me see where you at. You want to talk about it? Tom said, I think 30 to 35 attempts is a little excessive for Hurts. Lamar Jackson averages 23 attempts. Okay. Lamar Jackson also runs the ball about 10, 15 times a game. Lamar Jackson, you know, for the last couple of years, had one of the, the best running attacks in the NFL. Lamar Jackson also ain't won no a, a, a playoff game yet. He ain't going to no Super Bowl, okay? Until Lamar Jackson start throwing the ball with some, type, with some type of consistency, you know, Baltimore Ravens ain't going nowhere. They're about to pay him franchise-style money. OK, and until he gets with a quarterback coach in the offseason that can teach him how to operate from the pocket and throw the ball 30 to 35 times a game. Listen, there's about 70 to 75 plays per game. You mean to tell me that 35 passes out of 70, 75 plays a game is too excessive? No, no. I mean, you, you're just not winning in the NFL if he ain't throwing the ball 30 to 35 times a game. And he's got to be able to prove that he can throw it 35 times, 30 to 35 times a game with a completion percentage above 63, 64, 65, okay, and minimal turnovers through the air, not only interceptions but also fumbles, okay? I'm, I'm Tom, the only reason I'm saying this is because he's got to prove that he's the guy long-term, and he can't prove that he's the guy long-term if, if they're running the ball two to one. That just doesn't work. Because at some point in time, you're going to face a team that's built to stop your run, and they're going to stop you. And then your quarterback now has to be the guy to be able to put the ball in the air to get you positive yards, okay? Now, you can still be balanced, you know, if your quarterback can throw the ball halfway decent. And I'm not talking about just throwing it down the field because everybody wants to talk about the big plays. Listen, the big plays are earned. The shots down the field are earned. You can't get the shots down the field – until you either get the lead or you, you know, dominate running the ball up, 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 you know, you dominate running the football and you dominate the line of scrimmage. And with a lead, now you can go play action pass and you force the offenses to do some things, you know, that they might not, the defense, I should say, to force them to do some things that they really might not want to do. Okay. But if you think that the Eagles are going to win a Super Bowl running the offensive scheme that they ran last year, I got news for you, man. It ain't happening because you know what? At some point in time, somebody's going to take that run away and Jalen Hurts is going to have to throw the ball. They might even have a bad, you know, defensive game against a team and Jalen Hurts is going to have to throw the ball to get them back in the game. That's just the, 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 the truth. That's just a fact. It's not that, you know, I'm, I'm necessarily, you know, caping for, for Jalen to throw the ball 40 times a game. But in order for them to get to a place where they feel comfortable with him, for him to prove that he is the guy, 
he's going to have to put that football in there 30, 35 times this season. And he's going to have to score some touchdowns through the air. He's going to have to his, – his completion percentage is going to have to go up. Okay, his accuracy is going to have to get better. Um, his decision-making is going to have to get better. This is all the process, you know, that he's got to go through. And he's got to minimize – the, the the INTs. This is the process that he has to go through before the Eagles are going to feel comfortable. Because remember, they got two first round draft picks next year and two two number twos in 2024. Those are the insurance policies just in case Jalen Hurts isn't the guy. Okay, and I and believe me, you know Nick Sirianni, first year head coach, he realized after seven games he needed to go to a more run oriented system for his young quarterback i guarantee you nick feels this way because nick wants to throw the ball he proved that through the first seven games of last year okay um howie roseman wants to throw the ball jeffrey lurie believes that the only way that you win championships is with an elite level offense an elite level offense isn't necessarily an offense that strictly runs runs the football you have to throw the ball this coming from the greatest run advocate you know, in professional football today. I just need to see the balance. But Jalen's in prove-it mode, so that means he's going to have to throw the football, all right? Um, Let's see. Interesting here. Let's talk about this. David Bergner. David Bergner wants to know how many wide receivers will make the team and who do you think the four or five, four, five, or six are? Um, Top three, obviously. Man, listen, they got so many wide receivers on the roster, it's hard for me to even keep up. Um, Well, let's go with the obvious. We know that A.J. Brown, um, Devontae Smith, um, Quez Watkins, probably Greg Ward, um, um, Pascal, Zach Pascal, um, you know, that's five right there. You know, listen, Devin Allen can run like the wind, but can he still play football? Can he catch? You know, that's going to be the question there. Um, I think that, you know, when you look at the wide receivers, I think they're, they're, they're going to try to go too deep across the board. So if you go with your starters, you know, which are probably going to be Brown, Smith, and Watkins. Um, if you take it to the next level, probably your, your, your number two slot guy is Ward. Um, you know, I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to 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 get through it all and try to figure out with all the wide receivers. I mean, they got to have again another 12, 11, 12 wide receivers in in you know coming to camp. Um, you, know, you, you got some guys that you sign as free agents. You got some guys, you know, that have been here. Um, you got a guy like John Hightower um, trying to figure out whether he really wants to be a football player or not. The guy's got immense talent. He just hasn't stepped up. Um, you know, you got Jalen Rager, who for all intents and purposes, no matter what we think, he's probably going to be here unless, you know, someone um, is willing to give the Eagles something of great value for him. Um, but I also think that, <clears throat> when you get past the, the top three to four guys, it's really going to come down to um, how many of these guys can play special teams. How many of these guys can like really get it done on special teams? Because I'm a big proponent of this. I just think that, you know, there's probably, you know, three to five, you know, spots on the football team, on a football roster, a pro roster um, for guys who are primarily um, special teams players. Now, they may be still trying to grow into their positional role, um, but you know you you need special teamers, man. You need a couple of guys that will just you know that they're going to get it done. Um, so I, I, I look to I, I want to look at these wide receivers and see you know how they begin to um, develop from a special teams perspective. And I'm not even just talking about you know return guys. I'm talking about cover guys. Um, you know, flyers on the outside, um, guys coming down, you know, on kickoff, um, pump return, blocking, you know, who wants to do the dirty work in order, you know, to to grab a roster spot? And to be honest with you, I really don't know. I really don't know. I think over time we'll be able to 
you know, look at the, look at the situation throughout training camp and really see, um, you know, who's deserving to be on this roster and who's not. All right. Um, Jay says, um, all I'm saying is Jalen can't be letting wide receivers hang. Can't let wide outs hanging. Can't, can't be letting what I don't know how you word this, bro, but it's off. Letting wide, res, letting wide outs hanging when they're open. You got to air it out. Well, let's deal with that. Okay. Um, one of the hardest things, Jay, is for young quarterbacks to um, to understand the difference between um, the collegiate game and the professional game. And this is what I mean. Um, at the collegiate level, when when a guy gets when a guy gets open, nine times out of ten, he's like really open. The guy that's open in the NFL, he's barely open, and his cover guy is is closer. So sometimes a quarterback can just drop back, you know, at the collegiate level and kind of pick and choose where he wants to throw the ball because he knows once a guy gets beat, the likelihood of that guy getting caught is, is pretty slim. And the NFL is different. You know, that's why for young quarterbacks, being able to um, understand and learn how to throw the ball in rhythm, to throw it on time, to release it, you know, when the wide receiver's, you know, foot is is coming, when his foot hits the ground and he's coming out of the break, that ball's got to be out of, out of his hand. So when you talk about, you know, his ability, you know, to, 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 to not miss guys, a lot of times Jalen Hurts missed guys last year because he wasn't proficient at understanding when to let the ball go, and he didn't trust – that the receiver would be where he was supposed to be um, on time. You know, timing and rhythm in the passing game is of utmost importance because a lot of times you're throwing guys open or that ball's got to, you know, be hitting his hands at a particular time that allows him to make a, make a catch one tick, one beat late, okay? It, it could be a knockdown ball. It could be an interception. It could be a pick six going back the other way. Um, so what do you expect from a young quarterback who's still learning how to play the game? How do you, what do you expect from a young quarterback, you know, in 2021, who's still trying to adapt to the professional game? You know, there were some games where he played well. There were some games where he didn't. There were some plays where he had phenomenal plays and phenomenal throws. And there were some plays where he didn't. I would, I would submit to you the times where he threw the ball on time and rhythm and with anticipation, you know, he made some pretty darn good throws. The times where he was late, the times where he was indecisive, um, you know, there were some interceptions and there was some off target, you know, inaccurate throws. That's just, that comes with development. Um, but I think this year he'll be better. That's just my opinion. Okay. Um, see what else we got um hmm jeremiah he just got a you got a comment here he says if he's throwing it early successfully then the running game will naturally have more carries because your team is winning. I, I'm, I'm assuming you guys are having some conversations behind the scenes that I'm not privy to. I'm looking for some good questions, you know, to answer for you guys. And you guys are having your online question. Hey, make sure um, that you like the show. Uh, make sure you share it. And most importantly, um, you know, hit that like button, hit it, hit it, hit it. And then, you know, tell everybody about the show. And please, please, please subscribe, okay? Um, Julie wants to know, she wants to talk about, I'm, I'm going to jump off you right, right there, Jeremiah. Um, Julie wants to know, do you think um, BG still had, will still have it this year after the injury? Um, I've seen BG like, you know, three or four times in the last, you know, two or three weeks. And, and dude just, you know, he's full of energy, full of optimism. Um, if, if, if there's somebody who can come back from what he went through last year, it's him. And then, you know, like I talked about last week, he'll be coming back, fresh body, fresh legs, after having a, a whole year off from football. 
Um, in a lot of ways, it just might renew him um, physically. Um, you know, having to sit out a whole year the the the, the way that the way that he did. Um, I look for him to, you know, to have have a good year. I think that Brandon feels like he's got a couple of really good years left in him. Um, but coming off this injury, he's gonna have to come out, you know, and prove it. Because I think as as the years go go on, I think you saw it this year, you know, with the drafting of of Jordan Davis. You know, how he's not gonna sit and wait and let you know the team become you know decimated from a talent standpoint. You know, Jordan Davis is the heir apparent for the day when either Fletcher Cox says peace or the Eagles say peace to Fletcher Cox. You know, he's the guy that's going to step in and, and, and be the replacement. And you have to think that way. You have to be thinking, you know, at least three to five years down the road, especially if you, if you value those positions, positions like the offensive line, positions like the defensive line. I apologize. I'm outside and, you know, somebody lost their muffler. Anyhow, um, when you prioritize your offensive line and your defensive line, when you, you prioritize in your front, guess what? You better not ever become devoid of talent. I mean, you look at the offensive linemen that they drafted this year to replace, you know, um, Jason Kelsey, when he calls it a day, I just think it's a smart way to do things. Um, but I do believe that um, a guy like BG, you know, if, if he can't come back from it, you know, I don't know very many people that can come back from it. All right, no blah says, do I think that Gannon's hybrid defense would work? Well, I'm trying to figure out what that defense actually is going to look like. Because um, at the end of the day, I, I don't know whether what he put on the, the field last year was, you know, his defense in totality or whether, <coughs> excuse me, he was um, protecting players last last year. I'm not so sure what it is, you know, that Jonathan Gannon was trying to do from a defensive perspective last year. You know, we, we had everything from, oh, you know, I'm not a dime. We're not a dime team to, you know, two, three weeks later, you know, they got dime on the field. Um, you know, you, you you had, you know, coming out of training camp, well, which we're in a, we're in a position where, you know, we can surprise some people, you know, so we're going to be very vanilla during the preseason. And, you know, we'll show you some different things, you know, um, during the regular season, we didn't necessarily see that. I thought that they were pretty darn vanilla all year long. Um, they, you know, were they were pressure adverse. They were afraid to bring pressure. So now that you got cornerbacks and now that you got, you know, all the pieces, you know, to complement your defense, you know, we'll see what this hybrid looks like. Um, and we'll see how much of a hybrid it really is. I mean, they certainly got enough pieces to hybridize everything that they want to do from their 40 front to their 50 front and also being able, you know, to implement some, some, some 30 front, you know, stuff. Um, but we'll have to wait and see how innovative and how creative he can actually be. Um, so now, you know, just talking about, you know, um, a hybrid style defense and, you know, trying to implement what they can and what they cannot do. Um, the Eagles actually, um, Sign safety Jaquiski Tart, former um, San Francisco 49ers safety, um, over the weekend, signed into a one year deal. Um, listen, Howie ain't messing around. Um, I, I've, I've heard all kinds of reports about the guy that, you know, he's, he's a liability in pass coverage. Um, you know, he's a bigger safety. I think he's like, you know, 6'3. 6263, you know, 220 pounds. Um, <clears throat> he, he might be more of a box safety. Um, I, I don't know. What I do know is that, you know, how he ain't messing around. You know, he went, he brought it, he went and solidified the corner position, brought in Bradbury. Then a couple of weeks later, you know, we just we signed Tart. Um, I think that there's plenty of competition, you know, at every position for you to be able to extrapolate and get the best player that you can get. 
when I think about all the linebackers, let's just talk about the linebackers because we know they're going to rotate the defensive defensive line because, you know, the big guys need a breather nowadays. They don't train the way that they used to so they can play a full game. They just like to rotate. But when you look at the linebackers, they're going to do some of that too. But you got Dean, you got Edwards, you got, um, you know, you got White, um, you got um, – you still, you know, trying to figure out with um, Davion Taylor. Um, you got some competition at the linebacker position for playing time. And it's all going to come down to, you know, who wants it the most. Um, I think we're solid at the corner positions. You know, if you're going to go and get veterans like that, you don't necessarily need to, you know, have a competition out there. But you're solid with Maddox, you know, in the slot. And then you start looking at the at the safety position. You know, you got Epps. And Harris slated as your starters, you know, we're still trying to figure out what what Kayvon Wallace is going to wind up being. And then now you turn around and you bring in Tart. So you got guys, you know, when you talk about your big nickel, you know, maybe Tart is that guy that you insert in your big nickel package. But you certainly are creating enough competition, something that Nick Sirianni talks about incessantly. You're creating enough competition so that you can figure out who your best players are going to be so that you can create the best football team that you can actually create, all right? So, but as far as, you know, this hybrid defense, uh, I, I need to see it. I need to see it before I can really comment on it, all right? Um, Reggie Davis says that Jalen Hurts is, is the key to the whole season. Uh, he's a big part. I'm not going to say he's the key to the whole season, but he's a big part. Because, listen, Jalen Hurts can't block for himself. He can't run a route. He can't throw it down the field and run down there and catch it. He needs all of those pieces around him you know, to support him. And that's the case with every single quarterback in the NFL. Don't be deceived in thinking that Tom Brady is great just because of Tom Brady. Tom Brady has been great all these years because he's had a great supporting cast. And when the cast wasn't that great, he had phenomenal coaches to help him, you know, get things going in a, in a, in a much more um, timing way that took the pressure off of the guys who might not have been that good. And then the one season, his last season in um, in New England, uh, we saw, you know, without the supporting cast, what Tom Brady, you know, could look like. And I think if Tom was inserted in that situation, you know, listen, he, he probably retired because he can't take that beating. He can't take that smoke. He can't take, take that heat for 17 weeks, okay? Um, so I think at the end of the day, that's what you do. You know, you've got to figure out, how it is that you can, um, you know, help your quarterback. And let's just be honest, um, you know, Jalen Hurts is not going to be the end all to be all. Is he is, is he an important piece? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he's not the end all to be all. And don't believe that hey, if, if the Eagles don't come out and succeed early, that it's all his fault. Um, it's a team. It's 53 guys. It's going to take all 53 of them and some to actually win, okay? Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, Myron Fowler wants to know um, who's going to be our second tight end. That's an interesting question. Um, I believe that the Eagles signed a tight end, another tight end of free agency. Um, I believe you got Richard Rogers coming back. You've got, um, you know, Tyreek. What is Tyreek's last name? Um, I'm sure you guys will bring me up to speed, but he got hurt. The tall six eight kid that you know trans they trans they moved him over from um, transformed him from a quarterback to a tight end, and he seemed to be extremely extremely talented last year throughout training camp. And then he had a back injury that you know put him on the shelf for the rest of the year. Um, I think they're gonna have some options there, and I think that you know the options that they have are going to give them the opportunity to be able to free Dallas Goddard up. Listen, Dallas is the um, Dallas is the all-purpose tight end. This is the guy that can go out and catch passes. You know, he's a better, you know, pass. He's a better blocker than a lot of people give him credit for. But I also do believe that, you know, you got to figure out a way in protection situations to have a guy there, you know, that can, you know, help with the blocking. Um, you got to have another guy there to help, you know, when you really want to run the football. And then you got to have another guy there who can catch the football where, you know, when the focus goes 
to Dallas Goddard because he's been so proficient that you've got another tight end that you can put in and 12 personnel that's that's you know one back and two tight ends that can also catch the ball and create some issues um at that same position so listen we'll we'll see you know how it all pans out all right um let's see um Ezra wants to know, do I believe, hey, I, I don't believe it. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't believe anything that I haven't seen. But Ezra wants to know, do you really believe Jonathan Gannon can call an aggressive game? People say he didn't have the bodies, but he didn't even try. And listen, Ezra, I agree with you 100%. You know, you can't, you can't play um, – you can't be a protective defense coordinator even when you feel like um, – you know, you don't have all the pieces um, because that non-aggressive nature um, bleeds off into every other position and every other player on the defensive side of the ball. You know, I got to see it in order for me to believe it. I got to see him dial up some blitzes on a continuous basis. I got to see him, you know, want to be, want to create enough pressure and not always have to leave it up, you know, to the, to the defensive front, but to create enough pressure where you put the opposing quarterback and that offense behind the chains a little bit, you know, we play too protective, you know, let's not, let's bend, but don't break, but you spend so much time bending, bending, bending that sooner or later you wind up snapping. You don't just break, you snap. So it's just going to be interesting to see, you know, now that he has all the pieces, he's got some safeties, he's got some corners and he's got a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of talent at the linebacker position. And, and probably one of the best defensive lines, you know, that we've had in some time. Um, they're going to be able to, 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 to do some things. And I'd like to see them be a lot more aggressive, play a, a lot more aggressive style of football um, because pressure, as we know it, pressure bu bust pipes, man, you know. And, and for every quarterback, I, you know, I was having this conversation with someone just the other day about quarterbacks and pressure. I don't care. What quarterback you are, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Tom Brady. I mean, you don't believe me? Go back and look at um, the Broncos' run to Super Bowl 50 in the AFC Championship game and look what, you know, that Broncos defense did to Tom Brady. Tom Brady, you know, looked like an average quarterback in that game. Why? Because pressure is the great equalizer. Pressure is every quarterback's kryptonite. And if you can bring it and you can create it, you know, you can get a lot done. But when you let quarterbacks sit back and be comfortable and not have to worry about, you know, pressure because you're predictably going to drop in third down situations, you're not going to play a whole lot of man to man. And even when you come with pressure, you're only going to bring, you know, an extra linebacker. But you're not really drawing up the type of pressures that stresses protection and make and only gives a quarterback one read. You're not going to win against elite level quarterbacks like that. At some point in time, you got to devise, you know, the type of the type of scheme that makes him uncomfortable, the type of scheme that you can, you know, that you can disguise thing in a way that that quarterback's never seen it. And by the time he recognizes what it is, guess what? It's too late. He's either throwing an interception, an incomplete pass, or he's on his back. Simple. All right. Let's see. Um Now, that's an interesting point right here. Eagles fan 404 says Jalen was last in the league in check downs. Um, that, I, I think that as young quarterbacks begin to grow, they begin to understand the importance of understanding and knowing where their outlet is. Okay, When things down the field break down, when the coverage wins and you can't get what you want downfield, there's always a check down. There's always that that outlet. There's always that guy that you can get the ball to right now. Um, that's part of the growth. Because I tell you right now, you know, Tom Brady wasn't all that way. He wasn't always that way. You know, he learned over time that, hey, I can get, I can dump the ball off and get four or five yards. The objective is to keep the chains moving. You know, if I can keep the chains moving and get to a place from an offensive perspective where we're scoring points almost every possession that we get or close to 50 to 60 percent of the, the the possessions that we get now that puts stress on the other team's offense 
and that makes them do some things that they don't necessarily want to want to do but it also you know puts a lot of stress on the defensive side of the ball sometimes the prudent thing to do is to just take what the defense is giving you you don't have to force it you know you're not going you're not going to make a defense give up big plays because they can play passive well if they're going to play passive and they're going to play too high safety well hey let's run the ball let's go play action pass off of it let's hit the check down you know let's hit you know the the tight end sitting down between you know the 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 two linebackers let's hit the tight end up the seam let's split the safeties there's a lot of different things that you can do to force a defense's hand um but Jalen to your point listen he's got to learn how to take what the defense is giving him okay and not try to force the ball downfield for the big play because like I said earlier you know those things come as a result of what you do early in the game you can't just have the big play down the field because you want to. You got to earn that. You got to spend some time setting those plays up with runs and play action passes and and key breakers, things that they expect for you to do, but you got a different route off of it. Or you got a different concept off it that allows you, you know, to catch them by surprise. Because listen, those guys get paid too. All right. Um, let's see. Um. Ha. Huh. Okay. I was waiting on somebody to throw that out there. Kyle says, you know, Dominic and Sue is still out there. Make any sense to kick the tires on him for even more depth? Um, I assume not, but wanted to get your thoughts. Listen, at the end of the day, um, I don't think Howie's the type of guy, type of GM that, you know, that allows anything to go unseen or unchecked upon. I think that Dominic and Sue, you know, probably believes that he's still you know, one of the top defensive tackles in the game and, and probably wants to, you know, be paid as such. Um, can't say, you know, that I blame him, um, but I also believe that um, the Eagles are are up against the cap. I think they've only got about three, three and a half million dollars of pure cap space that's left right now. Um, and they probably can ill afford to spend much more money on um, on on you know, many more free agents. Um, so I wouldn't expect, but, you know, hey, you never know. If he's out there and you get in the first week of training camp and one of your, one of your you know, defensive tackles goes down, Milton Williams, Fletcher Cox, um, you know, um, you know, Hargrave, one of those guys go down, then, you know, you may have no other choice but to kick the tires, all right? Last question for the night. You guys, Jay Koch, you know, uh, do I think Gannon will run blitz at all? And I, I don't. I, I, I really don't. I mean, I haven't seen it. You know, first and second down is a great opportunity, you know, to, to run a run blitz, especially, you know, when you get a team that's predictably going to run the ball and a team, you know, um, who's not expecting it. Um, and if they go play action pass off of it, that's the thing that I know that he's afraid of. You just convert a run blitz into a pass blitz you keep going to you keep going to the quarterback because more times than not what's going to wind up happening if one of those blitzes come free the, the blitz pickup goes to the running back now you put them in a situation where they only get three or four wide receivers instead of five out into the route when you play passive if you play passive and i know i can get five out guess what i'm going to stress your defense and get five guys out into the route um but at the end of the day um here we go again trying to speculate on what Jonathan Gannon will or will not do. Only time will tell. All right. Um, to close out, I want to give you one more fact. The Eagles this year will not play against one quarterback that won a playoff game in 2022. They will play against four guys that lost in the playoffs last year. And these were playoff quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, and Ryan Tannehill. All right. Hey, listen, that's the show for tonight. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you like, spread the word, hit that like button, go to the YouTube channel, and please, please, please subscribe. Um, um, tell everybody, you know, about the announcement at the beginning of the show. Um, we'll, I'll be talking about it again next week. Uh, potentially, I'm traveling again again i'm out of the country next week so it may not be a show next week but i'll do a video to let you guys know for sure um and 
um, you know, let everybody know, you know, what's going on and, you know, stay tuned because in the upcoming weeks, like I said, there'll be a press conference to let you guys know where I am and also let you know that there's some exciting things coming up for the Seth Joyner show in the future. Hey, listen, as always, you guys be good to each other and take care of each other. But most importantly, make sure you love each other. I'll see you guys down the road. Peace. Peace.